Welcome everyone to Mother and Refuge of the End Times. I'm Ron Ray from Australia and today I'm joined with a new co-host Stephen Tim and Stephen is from Wisconsin. Is that right Stephen? Yes, uh, capital city of Madison. And you might know Stephen from his voice. He's one of our major voiceover artists. So it's great to have you on um, with us for a webcast, Steve. Well, thank you. I've been, I was really looking forward to doing this. This is going to be cool. And today we're, we're blessed to have a really uh, special guest with us, Ted Flynn. Uh, Ted, I'll get you to introduce yourself, but today we're going to be focusing on one of your, um, I guess it's your most recent book, which is The Great Reset, um, the De Satan's Plan and Heaven's Triumph. I'll get you to introduce yourself uh, to our audience, please. Yes, my name is Ted Flynn. It's nice to be on this show. I've never, uh, I've never used this technology that you're using, Steamyard. I like it, and I think it's even, in some respects, easier than than Zoom. But uh, for the last 35 years, my wife and I have run an organization called Signs of the Times called Signs of the Times Apostolate. Its, its website is sign.org, and you can see what we've been doing over the last 35 years. We've had a magazine, and we have probably reported on, on all of the major apparitions in world history. It used to be four times a year, four times a year with, with uh, annual smaller letters then three times a year. Now it's an 85 page magazine twice a year with a summer letter. So we've been reporting on all sorts of spiritual phenomena virtually for 35 years and pretty much written on everything imaginable that's going on with the Blessed Mother's apparitions in world history. It's been a tremendous- And you've written, you've written a number of books? Yes, the first book that my wife and I wrote is called The Thunder of Justice. Its, it, 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 it's subtitle is The Warning, the Miracle, the Chastisement in the Era of Peace. And it, I, we spoke about, it's not a definitive anthology by any respects, but it's, it's a, um, it, we get into the major apparitions in world history like Guadalupe, Lourdes, La Salette, Medjugorje, Garabandal, Akita, Fatima, Rudabak, and that sort of thing. And we've been even updated in 2010 to include Kabeho and, and Our Lady of All Nations, which are both approved uh, uh, by the local ordinaries. But th then, then I wrote a book on the political philosophy of, um, of, of, of what's going on in the world called Hope of the Wicked, the master plan to rule the world, which a lot of people thought was hysterical when it came out, other than what happened year after year after year, everything. Got what, what year was that? That was released in the year 2000. Right. So you were well ahead of the um, curve. You were well ahead of the game like you. Yeah, you I, was the, I was the village idiot for quite a long time. And then at people, you know, I was called a conspiracy theorist for a long time, but the book had 1,216 footnotes in literally the words of the world leaders where they wanted to bring the world. There would, have, there would not have been a great reset if it hadn't been for um, Hope of the Wicked. And all of these things where the, it, it was never really about me. I just quoted where the world leaders, where they said they wanted to bring the world, the top financial people, top political, all of the pundits, the intellectuals, the, the global elites of how they were orchestrating a plan literally to take over the world. And that's what became the World Economic Forum that has been happening day by day week by week, month by month, they've been implementing a plan to virtually take over the world in their own image of what they want it to be. And did you find out about these sinister plans through your own research or was it mainly through your um, reading of Our Lady's apparitions and warnings? Um, can you tell us a little bit about the background of how you came into this sphere? It was, it was kind of an oddball thing. 
um, for graduate school, I was at the London School of Economics. And, you know, I went over as an idealistic, I wouldn't say socialist, but wanting to virtually change the world through policy. I had already been to school in Washington, D.C. I had uh, went to the University of Fribourg in Fribourg, Switzerland for a while. And so <clears throat> when I was at the LSE, um, I went over studying health economics. And, um, and then I literally saw that that whole brand of socialism didn't work. It took about two weeks when I visited a health facility. And I literally saw that if it were five o'clock, there was a doctor ready to leave. The doctor would leave pretty much a dead body on the threshold of his door rather than treat the patient because it was socialized medicine. And I realized right then, very young, <clears throat> that if you take the incentive for excellence out of the life of an individual, then by and large, you're going to get socialism. And so it was a gradual process. I had read a book called None Dare Call It Conspiracy and None Dare Call It Treason, which was by a guy named John Stormer. And uh, I literally saw that, you know, uh, there was a group of people. This book had five million copies in print, five million. It was a very small book, very thin, um, you know, like a penguin type classic size. And I began to see through reading that book that there's a cabal of evil people that have agendas of their own. It's not a conspiracy theory for anybody who thinks that there aren't people with money uh, that have enormous sums of money like you see today with virtually the trillions of, or billions of dollars with people and trillions corporately with people with like-minded uh, ideologies. If a person doesn't understand that their agenda is virtually to control things and people, it's not that I'm a conspiracy theorist, it's that everybody else is naive. These people do have a control, and it's not the first time in history, and it's literally the story of civilization itself. Exactly, yeah. And like you said, it's not the first time in history. Um, what my, um, caught my attention about your book is that it comes from a Catholic perspective. And when we hear a lot about, um, we hear some Christians talking about the Great Reset, but there's, there's very, it's only recently, basically, that we've heard uh, Catholics enter into this dialogue on the Great Reset and talk about the Catholic perspective, and especially in terms of Our Lady and the apparitions. Can you tell us um, a little bit about Our La the background of Our Lady's apparitions and, and her warnings about Freemasonry and about um, a world centralized power and so on? Well, yeah, you talk about the Great Reset. When, when I released Hope of the Wicked in the year 2000, I was the first Catholic to have ever released a book on the political philosophy of that genre. And it had all been evangelical and Protestant. It's a subject yes. that Catholics hadn't really touched. And then as, as you begin to look at what the Blessed Mother's agenda is, they frankly dovetail. You can see you know, you could look at a scripture verse of how old this is. It's one of my favorite scripture verses in the entire Bible. It's John 10:10. 10, 10.10a 10, 10, 10 says, Satan is out to Satan comes to kill, destroy, and steal. That's 10.10a. 10, look at how emotive those words are. Kill, destroy, and steal. That's Satan's agenda. But then 10.10b, 10, 10 the last half of that verse is that I come to give you life and give it more abundantly. That has been the battle of the ages virtually since Cain killed Abel, every, every revolution that's ever happened. And we're the 23rd great empire in world history. This isn't really new. The term the Great Reset is just another name. There have been Mesopotamians, there's been Greeks, the Sumerians, the Spanish Armada, the French under the Sun King. We've had all sorts of the Persian Empire, especially under Azurias, which uh, conquered a, um, a big part of the world. So this isn't new thinking. Um, this is not a new concept in world history. 
the historians miss one major point in world history as they write about the transition and transformation of one culture to another. It's the Lord that brings a nation up and it's the Lord that brings a nation down due to obedience. That's the major distinguishing, distinguishing factor in world history of how these things transition. And so whether it's World War II, where the British Empire sailing the seven seas for spices and, 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 and commodities, after World War II, it was the United States then that, that became the new reserve currency that was worked out at Bretton Woods uh, at, a, at a big hotel up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. It was Bretton Woods Conference where the IMF, the International Finance Corporation, and the World Bank came out of that process. And, and also the United Nations was very much propped up by these institutions. But the thing that makes this great reset, which is just another name for a group of people to take control, that's really all it is. But the thing that makes this very, very, very different than any other one in world history is we now have the nuclear capability of nations, which is fairly new since World War II in 1945. So that's fairly new in terms of history itself. And then we also have a uh, an interconnect, an inter, the interconnectivity of the world economy is brand new, where whatever you're driving, those parts are made all over the world in different countries and different companies. And due to the interconnectivity, a lot of these major countries and transnational corporations are all cooperating. So what happened after World War II is the United States then became the, uh, an empire. And, and it's been very short lived. If you look at Rome, Rome officially historians fell under, at, at the year 454. The Greeks lasted a long time. The British lasted a long time. But the United States right now is pretty much over as an empire as we're decaying morally. Um, militarily and every other way from within. Will Durant, the great uh, historian, said great empires are usually not conquered from without. They commit suicide. And that's what's happening right now to the United States and the West. We're, we're committing suicide. And it's, and it's the moral that is bringing the world down where the, the protective hedge of blessing which is right out of Deuteronomy 28 is being taken away due to sin. That's that is that's a very very biblical concept. It's the Lord who raises up, and that's the Lord who raises down. Yeah, I, <clears throat> pardon me. I for one completely agree. Um, one question I would have on that is, as far as the United States is concerned, when do you think the uh, the moral degradation started. Um, a lot, and the reason I ask is because a lot of people, uh, especially when we're talking about things like birth control, uh, it's really interesting because in contraception that the Protestants and the Catholics were really simpatico on their stance on birth control up until very recently in the 1930s. And yeah, so... Conference. I'm sorry? It was called the Lambeth Conference in England. Okay. Okay. Um, could you unpack that a little bit? Because I, I find that interesting. Well, if you really, t I, I think the, um, I think the blessing you talk about, you know, trying to pinpoint a date, everything is cumulative. It'd be a little too cutesy to say any one thing, mm -hmm. but if anything could generally probably be agreed on by a, a, a lot of historians. The United States now, this would be a personal opinion uh, among myself and I think people like William Manchester, who wrote about, who was one of America's historians in the 60s and 70s. Uh, he wrote the book American Caesar uh, about General Manchester and, and, and a book on Nixon, a very renowned author. What happened is, I think when, when Kennedy was shot, I think America lost its innocence. 
Mm-hmm. And then if you want to look also at the 1960s, the, 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 the biggest seminal event that, that changed the, the concept of how the species relate to each other sexually was the pill. The pill actually took the whole concept of procreation and it just enabled recreational sex. Sure. Pretty much around the year 1968 when it was, it was gaining traction and just and they were dealing with the dosages of what they gave women. But it was, you could look to the year 1968. And then right in the middle of that also, um, Kennedy was trying to keep America out of Vietnam, but the great, the, the big corporations were pushing, pushing them into it. Why? Because there's money in warfare. Now there's something very, very, a, a very small um, fact that people don't know about. There was a, a very big conference that pre- this is never talked about anymore. I read the book 40 years ago. And the author's name is Robert Llewellyn, if anybody wants to get it on Amazon. Okay. Um, it, it, there was a meeting that Kennedy got together and he wanted to get the brightest, you know, the best and the brightest, which was David Halberstam's book on the Kennedy administration. Uh, and he got together all of the great minds. He got together. And he got Kenneth Galbraith to handle everything to do with finance. He, he got the great historians. And it was chaired by a person by the name of Herman Kahn, and that's K-A-H-N, who is the president of the Hudson Institute, where they said he was one of the brightest men in the world with something like an IQ of 173 or something. Mm-hmm. And they, they met in Iron Mountain, New York. And Kennedy posed this question to these men. He said, can America prosper as a nation without war? This is Sorry never about that. I had a disconnection back again now. What's that again? I'm sorry, I had a disconnection. So I'm I'm back again now. Oh, you're back again. Okay, so should I continue where I just broke off? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, Sorry I, about yeah. that. Okay. All right, so Kennedy put the question to these people up in Iron Mountain, New York, which which is in uh, north of New York City, Iron Mountain. And to this very day, people see their trucks all over this country. They're record keepers. That's the way they've they've morphed into a company. They keep records electronically, and they're usually behind secure facilities. But can America prosper without war? And so when, when Kennedy was shot, um, they asked if I, they asked Johnson if, if Iron Mountain even existed, and Lyndon Johnson said no, it didn't. And John Kenneth Colbrate's wife said, "Then somebody's got to tell me where my husband went once a month for several years." And so, what it boiled down to is the military-industrial complex began to run the country, which exactly what uh, the in his in, in his last speech. Um, President Eisenhower basically warned the country the thing that could bring it down with military industry. Yes. And that's precisely what happened. And so this is this is a background story and in, in the people that wanted to promote war, which we then saw after, you know, Kennedy was shot. Um, then we saw, you know, the pill. And then Vietnam had really been going on, and then you know all of the way into the you know like what was what was the helicopter taking everybody out of Saigon? What was that? Seven nineteen seventy five, where we were, were back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you know, it, it, the conclusion was America could not prosper without war. It's very seldom talked, about, but this is what we're facing about this military industrial complex that a lot of people now call it the deep state. In Hope of the Wicked, I called it a cabal of evil men. And the deep state had existed. Now I've actually changed that to what I now call it the national security state. Because at the part of that is this knowledge company that has enormous influence that anybody, you know, 
it's been happening all over the world with technology are controlling public opinion. And now we have probably the most evil of them all, of which with the artificial technology, with all of the that company. That basically, the, 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 they're all basically programmed to be anti-democratic, anti-democratic. So, Ted, um, I, I guess a lot of people now are quite familiar, especially I think a, a lot of my guests and my audience is familiar with, um, you know, the world government and the plans of the elite and so on. And um, what we really want to hear today at the beginning of Lent is the second half of your of your book. I know that your book is called the ba Satan's Plan and heaven's triumph i want i want to focus on and i know that you want to do that as well on heaven's triumph and the message of hope that our lady gives us and some of our lady's remedies um to face these evils that we're uh, up against right i totally agree as a matter of fact um I've, I've tried to focus more in the last several years people have recognized that the great reset is not a downer of a book but it's actually very encouraging because it does give what the Blessed Mother's messages are, how encouraging they are. But I, I always like to tell a story now wherever I speak because people re it resonates with people. And all the, everywhere I go and if people that I talk to, they're dealing with all sorts of problems in their families, their marriages, their kids. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll have overtaken our culture. We're being inundated on a virtual daily basis with nothing but negative news. And yet gospel literally means the good news. And there's a story I like to tell, and it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor for athletics. Since I've been a boy, I've been following a lot of sports, and I've noticed this, and I literally just saw this even in the Super Bowl. That was just about two weeks ago here, the football here just a few weeks ago. And I saw the exact same thing again, no matter what the team is, whether it's NHL hockey, whether it's FIFA World Cup, where it's Major League Baseball, whether it's the Stanley Cup in, in, in hockey, no matter what it is. There's two things that are what happens when a, an announcer goes into the winning dressing room. And the first thing he says, how did you guys get here? How did this happen? And they say the exact same thing first. And the first thing they say, you know, as a team, they say, all we did all year long was practice the fundamentals. Let's say it, let's just say it's hockey. All, all we practiced all year was skate, shoot, pass, conditioning, staying out of the penalty box. Anybody that knows hockey knows that if a, if a team is a man down five on four, the other team has a 40% chance in that two minutes of a penalty of the other team scoring. And a lot of these, these scores are 2-1, 1-0, 3-2, 4-3, 4-2. They're close. So losing by a goal or two is the difference of the game. So in every single time the microphone goes into that locker room, we practice the fundamentals. And then the announcer will say, and we'll get back to what that means spiritually for peace of soul, and, and spiritual prosperity for people right now of what that means for us. And the second thing, the, they say, you know, it seems like you guys just enjoy each other. And it says, you're funny you mention that. In, the, in three weeks, we're all going over to Scotland to play the, the, the golf courses of Ireland and Scotland. We've got 14 people going. And, and, and that was on an NHL team just last season. Where they said, "Yeah, we're all we're all going to go play." Fourteen of us. Our wives get together um, uh, before before the game for dinner. We go to each other's kids' birthday parties, and you know they just said we just enjoy each other, and that's the difference. And people see that about our team. What he talk, what that person's talking about is two things: they trust each other, and they have a community among their team. So if you want to put this in a, in a spiritual basis, we know the fundamentals of the faith. We don't have to get dragged down every single day. I'm actually following my own advice right now 
I'm, I'm going to mass daily. I just started three days ago. Um, the, the total consecration, of Louis, <clears throat> the 33 day total consecration of Louis de Mumford. I can't control what's going on in the world, but I can control my time. We know the fundamentals, it's prayer, it's quiet, <clears throat> it's the daily rosary, the mass being the center of your life if you can do it, it's adoration, it's scripture reading, but we don't do these things and that's the problem. And, and the second part of that, that will bring peace of soul. And the second part of that is what we have to get involved in our community to build each other up like the team, the winning teams. They trust each other. They like each other. But what happens many times with Catholics, they just love to argue about the incidental, the unimportant. They like to find division. And, and if a person is an unbeliever, do they want to be a part of that community if all they hear is each other fighting? But what people gravitate to is people caring for one another. St. Paul said to obey the law of the New Testament, the, the, a law. Listen to what Paul's saying. The law is done away with. It is finished. But Paul's saying the law is to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. I have never won an individual to the gospel message ever by arguing. Not in my entire lifetime have I ever won a soul to the gospel. But a person will know when you care for them, if you'll be the one to spend time when they're going through a difficult problem. And this focus right now in the church on, on nothing but the negative is exactly the reason for our demise. We haven't made apostles. The single message of Jesus throughout his whole life, the reason for the incarnation itself, was to change the hearts of people, whether it's a Nicodemus, whether it's a Joseph of Arimathea, whether it's a Matthew who was frankly an extortionist, whether it's a simple uh, fisherman, whether it's the Zebedee fishing company of James and John, uh, Peter as a fisherman, and so um, when people sense that there's unity and there's love among people, the people want to be a part of that. Your community is drawn to that. But because Catholics and a lot of Christians just are arguing about a lot of things, that's the reason why we're not seeing the growth in the church. They're not seeing an alternative way of living. And, and unless we stop arguing about about everything that's unimaginable unimag of doctrine, more people aren't going to want to be a part of the Christian walk. Yeah, I think that that uh, that's absolutely spot on. Um, I just I, I'm I'm just listening to you, and I I can't agree more with what you said. And I think that that is one of the uh, objections that I've personally heard, you know, talking to people about the faith is that, you know, coming from the outside in, um, I'm, I'm also personally, I'm also a Protestant convert. So um, I'm actually just a few years into the Catholic faith. And so I've been on both sides of the fence. I, I joke with people and I say that I'm a recovering Lutheran. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I completely agree with you. And, and when people from outside the church see that disunity, and that arguing and stuff like that, that, you know, people look at that, and they're going to be like, well, that's not something I want to be a part of. I mean, that's not cool. Well, the fact so. is the church isn't growing. Mm -hmm. Yep. They're not seeing the life, but I can tell you wherever you see life, people will be drawn to it. Yep. As I say, you don't win a, a, a disciple or a convert through intellectual argument solely you, may, you, you know there may be some arguments of why a person gravitates i'm talking now about the general faith but, but when a person sees love helping they want to be a part of that when they see relationships where they're where they generally consider it and kind to each other there are whole ministries that all they do is report on the negative from morning literally till nighttime 
from the time you bat your eyes in the morning to the time you go to sleep. All they're doing is reporting on the negative. So my question would be, is how many disciples are they making? The, the biggest issue of the day when Jesus walked the earth where everything else was 12 feet below, uh, under it was basically the issue of Roman occupation. Jesus never addressed it until he was the, the, the Pharisees tried to trap him of wh whose figure was on the coin. And he said, give to a very, very short answer about the biggest political and social issue and cultural issue of the day for all of the Jews being under Roman occupation. Give to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to God what is God. And what did he do? He went out and made disciples. He, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. I'm coming to your house tonight for dinner. People want to be a part of something where they see harmony and relationships. I'm not talking about a milk toast faith and, and basically a vanilla or plaid attitude, but I'm talking about something where the relationships are not divided over things all day long of people taking shots at each other. And there is a reason oh. why the church is weak, and this is a principal reason for it. It says in, in Timothy, all the gospel is, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and instruction, and in righteousness that we all be made perfect. So the doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction is a part of that. There, there are times where there needs to be fraternal correction, but that's not the major issue that I'm addressing. Uh, I'm interested in finding out a bit about your perspective on Our Lady and her role in this, let's say, rehabilitation or renewal of the church. And um, I know that on your website, you do cover a lot of Our Lady's apparitions and, and you have written a book exclusively on Garabandal, I think. Um, I would love to hear your point of view from what Our Lady is trying to do in our times to help us to, to, um, to renew our church. Well, that's a very broad brush. But um, that's the way the Blessed Mother speaks also sometimes, too. Um, she specifically said at Medjugorje, I have a great plan for the salvation of the world. Think about that. Whether a person believes it or not, I've always been frustrated now for, for 35 years about the people that are doctrinally very, very sound. Uh, I get that. But yet, and they can argue all sorts of nuances and all sorts of fine points. And I get that. And there is that place of doctrine is that we know something by its boundaries and it has to stay in that for order or else we'll have chaos. But the point is, is that here's the Blessed Mother coming all over the world. I mean, go look at literally since the 1930s, Pont you know, uh, Bono, Borang in, in, in Belgium, Monte Chiari, Italy, 1947, Bono, Borang, 1932-33. I mean, you go all the way back, Rue de Bac, La Salette, Guadalupe. It's a love letter. It's a modern day epistle is what it is. And if since Paul's not still writing them, you know, the Trinity has sent the mother of Jesus to do it. And, and basically she's penning these 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 letters in the form of apparitions where she's pretty much saying the exact same thing and that her love is so great for humanity. And as she said at Medjugorje, she would to Father Rene Lauren, uh, the visionaries were told that the Blessed Mother said she'd come in every home if necessary. So it, it's, it's a love letter is what it is. It's a modern day epistle is what she's doing. And whether it's Medjugorje and, you know, um, June 24th or 25th in Medjugorje, Garabandal, um, 1961, which has actually always been my pet for a lot of other spiritual reasons, because it's the only thing that, in my opinion, can connect the dots for all of humanity that can save it be because we're so collectively lost and where 
where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And that's going to be the reason for Garabandal. It's going to be so great, so fantastic, so big, so cosmic, so spiritually true that it's going to be a shock to the entire world, a shock of grace. Are and you talking it, about the miracle or the warning or something, or something else? They're, they're really the same thing. You know, uh, they're two separate events, but it's like a play. One's Act One and Acts Two. Act Two, because the warning is going to be a, a grace that's never been seen in the history of the world. It, there's no scriptural precedent for it. I mean, we have scriptural precedent twice for days of darkness in the Old Testament, so we can never say that there won't be that ever again because we have a scriptural precedent for that. But we have ne we've had the parting of the Red Sea, which was a big, big deal, but it was a very localized event for in, in, a, in a just a, a country of the world, then this is going to be every single person in the world will see the state of their soul as God would judge it. It has different names. It's, it's the warning of viso in Spanish, um, the illumination of conscience, the judgment in miniature, um, the, a correction of conscience. A lot of people speak like this that have... Um, um, uh, near-death experiences or NDEs as they call them. But then within one year with the operative word within, I have two chapters in the book on this. They're two of the longest chapters, the warning and the miracle and what it will mean for, for the world at large. And um, it, it's going to be something, as I say, that's never happened uh, there's no precedent for it, but that's how great the grace is going to be for humanity. And it, it's going to, uh, with, so what will happen uh, within a year, which is, doesn't necessarily have to be in the same calendar year, because I have, I have in banker's boxes about 12 feet from me, every single thing that was ever written on Garabandal that I found anywhere in the world, all of the way back to the original Garabandal magazines that were called, um, uh, with Joey Lomangino, it was just called Garabandal. And then Barry Hanratty took it over and it became the Garabandal Journal when, when Joey Lomangino died. But it, 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 it's been more of an anecdotal story that it would take place in the same car, same calendar year, and there are people who followed it. But the so only that's not way... necessarily co correct. What? Yes, so that's not necessarily correct. That it will take place within the same calendar year. No, if you go back, this is what I'm saying. If you go back to the original writings, there are people who have been great friends of Garabandal. There have been great promoters of it. I know them. I've known of them. I've met many, many of them. Others I haven't. But the story is now that it'll be in the same calendar year that, you know, apparently Mary Lowley or Conchita said it would be. But that isn't what was said in the early data. So if you go back to the early writings, many years ago, I asked Conchita why she never spoke on Garabandal. And she gave me a incredibly wise answer, a very, very wise answer. She said, you know, I was 12 years old at the time. She said, the best thing to do is go back to what was said then. But, you know, if you want to get into... Mm. With, a with, really good point. It goes, yeah, go back to the early. And because what happens over time... She was 12 I, years I was, old, yeah. Yeah, I tell a story and then, you know, you tell a story and then you tell Stephen a story and somebody else hears the story from Steve. And by the time it gets around the table in the next week, the tadpole has become a blue whale. And so uh, I've, I've stayed with the original writings and what was said. The operative word is that the, the miracle would be within one year. It never said the same calendar year. I know the people who said it. It may be true and it may not be true, but I'm going with the original writings. Many people also are saying that the miracle would be in the month of April. That may be true. 
it may, it may be something was said, but their secrets and these visionaries have a profound ability not to leak them. And then people think they're getting data and they're piecing the story together. And again, the tadpole becomes a big fish and over time becomes a whale. And so um, is it within, you know, is it March, April, May, which many people are saying? And then uh, there are a whole group of people saying it's going to be on a Thursday in April. It may happen, but it may not. What was said, I can tell you there's an interview with Conchita on Irish television when she was in probably her late 20s where her kids were uh, outside the, the room where they were taping with an Irish host. And she said March, April, May or June. So that's from her lips as a very, very young. But again, everybody's making making these these stories into what they think is going to be fact. And what happens a lot of times with a lot of people that follow this and many times there's one person in a relationship, by and large, it will probably be the woman who's most open to this because you go to these Marian meetings and they're about 80 percent woman and then let's say she's saying something at home or to her friends but somebody's not necessarily skeptical which implies a negativity to begin with but may be cautious and then things don't happen exactly like the individual says and then that person falls away because they've been humiliated by being wrong and that's exactly the curse of not guessing at all of this data on a continual basis and what happens is a lot of the faithful fall away. And I've seen it now over the last 35 years of how many people have fallen away because it doesn't happen like they think it will. And it's not going to happen like we think. We can, we can look at all of this data on any apparition that's major prophecy. And I can tell you this for absolute fact. It will happen exactly like it was written but not as we thought. And Malachi Martin himself even told me that when I had a meeting with him in his home in New York in 1993, and he had been around a lot of this stuff, and he said it will happen like you, it, it will not happen like you think, but it will be happen exactly as it was written. In the exact same way, Fatima happened exactly as it was written, but who would have ever perceived that this country called Russia would spread her errors throughout the world like it did? Mm. So were you, did you interview Conchita and, uh, um, or was it just like a conversation that you had with her? No, I, I've never interviewed, a, uh, I've never known her to ever do interviews for, for since she was a young, young woman. She, she doesn't. She says the same thing. Um, and, and I've never um, felt as if to go up and talk to her, which I know people who know her, um, th there's frankly always been a bit of a regal quality around her. Um, there's a maturity. And, you know, when COVID started, it's the first time I've ever known her to speak. When COVID started, she literally made a statement which first time I can ever remember one outside of giving the interview when she was very, very young. And she's probably been burned like all of these people have um, to where um, she talked about how COVID would slow people down. And, and it was a release statement, which really surprised me. And it would give people the ability to be more circumspect to think about their spirituality by slowing down. And for me, that's actually what happened during COVID, where even masses were suspended here uh, for several months. There was a church that, that kept adoration going. And so you want to go back to the fundamentals. Everybody's complaining how they can't go to mass. And I understood that. But I can tell you in, in one of the largest parishes in all Northern Virginia, which I live right outside Washington, D.C., in literally uh, uh, the, the SMSA of this area is the fifth largest now in the United States. 
there are, there are about 5 million people in our standard metropolitan sampling area, the way census do, does it. There were only about eight people a day at adoration. So everybody's talking why they can't go to mass, but there's Jesus present in the Eucharist and nobody's going, nobody's got time. <laughs> Home all day and half, three quarters of them not even working anyway. It's only when we lose him that we recognize how much we, we need him. Right. So, you know, it, it, we, we know the fundamentals. How often do we do adoration? How often do we do go to confession? How often is the rosary said? How often is there prayer? I mean, do, do the math. I've done the math on this for how many hours in a year. Um, uh, you know, uh, 24 hours, you know, uh, a day times seven days a week times a month, times 12, let's say times five years, how many general people spend an hour in Eucharistic adoration in a year that are generally going to church? The answer is very, very, very few. You were mentioning how you think um, the apparitions of Garabandal are pivotal or are key to um, heaven's plan. Can you go a bit more into depth about that? Why you think they're pivotal? Or... Well, it you know, if somebody were to understand Garabandal, which I suspect your listenership is, is is pretty aware of it generally, but think of the repercussions about every just this alone uh, about how many people will will change. And after literally seeing the state of their soul over uh, our book it, that we, my wife and I released in 1993 called The Thorn Thunder of Justice, that was actually the beating heart, the brain um, and, and every vital organ of the book, because it was such a pivotal check, those two chapters in the book, although it dealt with a lot of the other because it accentuated of how important that would be. But imagine for a second um, people that you know that see the state of their soul as God would judge it. I, over the last several decades, have probably met 20 people who have experienced this in their life. Some of it has been gradual where they have been shown it as a grace. And I did a film called Prophecy in the New Times where I filmed a person by the name of Richard Bingold who actually just died about two years ago. Um, and his, I think he was in his late 70s. And so I interviewed him for the film and he talked about what happened. It, there was a movie called The French Connection. Um, it was the story of a cop in New York trying to break a drug ring coming in from Marseille, France. And the cop's name was Popeye Doyle. And it was a film where Gene Hackman played Popeye Doyle. And a man by the name of Richard Bingold worked with Popeye Doyle as a policeman in New York City. And so Richard Bingold went down to Miami when the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, was starting to grow. And he, he you know, I'm not sure, you know, he never said he was doing drugs or anything, but he, he got into an immoral lifestyle, the boating culture, the drinking culture. He wasn't treating his family well. And he didn't physically abuse a son that he spoke about. And this is on the film. This isn't a story that I'm telling out of school. This is, this is his public testimony that he told all over the world. And he said he was very rough on a son. And then he was given the grace. People have to recognize this is a grace. And he was given the grace of seeing his state of his soul. Now, this guy was about 260 pounds, six foot five, and he literally fell to his kitchen room floor, and he said he couldn't get off the floor for five hours weeping about everything that he had seen. And it's where the Lord shows the individual like a slow motion movie of their life, of where there was serious sin. And, you know, you know how you go through your phone and you can scroll just by, you know, hitting the screen and you can see the images of how you can go slow or fast. 
is how I've always translated what's happened to people. But I've met now a number of people that all pretty much have the exact same story. And they all say it's the single biggest event in their entire life where nothing else is even close to it. That is what I'm now calling the divine reset. This is heaven going to be resetting on its terms. We see the rot, the stench, the corruption around us in everything that it, the downward moral decline that's very, very rapid at the moment. And it's going to take a spiritual event like this to turn it around. Nothing else can do this now. We're too far gone. It's going to be God's call right now. It's God's, it's God's card to play this. And that's going to be his ultimate act of mercy, this act of grace. So if anybody is really studying Garabandal, they should actually go back to the early writings to see what was said then, rather than many of the stories that have gotten to be anecdotal over time with somebody said based upon somebody said. And, and the stuff is pretty much accurate, you know, but um, th th some of the nuances are just, they're extrapolated more than they should be. And, and that's a very... Lot of, sorry, there's a lot of hype at the moment on social media about the Pope visiting Moscow. And, and I'm just concerned that it's going to bring a lot of false um, hope to people that, you know, he may visit Moscow and then nothing may happen. So... <laughs> What, what do you have any information about Moscow? Yeah, about I do. That? I'm, I'm, um, I've, uh, the next issue in our magazine, uh, is, is on it's a very, very long article on Garabandal, and this is one of my major points in it. Um, that story originates with one person and one person only. His name mm. is Albrecht Weber, he was a German man who even went to live in Garabandal and is now buried in Al Garabandal. And so uh, he said he was told that story at the, at the kitchen table in Conchita's home all of the way back in 1965. Now, the part, no, so let's just say that's the part that's being told. Now let's, mm. let's, get, let's unpack this a little bit of how this has been more recent. I first heard of Garabandal in 1984 with, believe it or not, from just a neighbor who we, we met at church whose, whose father had actually sold Joey Lomangino's um, trash recycling business in New York City. Joey Lomangino, mm -hmm. uh, a, a company called Star Recycling which stood for second time around. Because when I talked to him once in the early 90s, I said, oh, you named it after Garabandal, Star in the Mountain. And he was a New York Italian garbage man. And he said, no, Teddy. He said, I named it after a uh, second time around. He said, I'm a garbage man in New York. And so I had met somebody whose father had sold Joey's business for his many, many years later. So I'd been around it. And so of, of all of the people that I've met many, many, many years and followed Garabandal and written on Garabandal, because the book that my wife and I released was in 1993. And so we spent five years writing it. And a lot of the material was from MMP, St. Edmund Campion. And nobody else had seen a lot of that data because nobody else, because at that time, you were Fatima only. You were, you know, you were Garabandal only, you were Medjugorje only, and everybody stood in their lane, and um, nobody really bounced outside of that too much. But we began to see that the Blessed Mother wears a lot of different color sashes, and we put them together in a book, which at that time nobody had quite done yet. So we had seen a lot of the material that we had researched for over five years, to pick up a lot of this information of what was said, including people like Sister Faustina, but Ab uh, where she talked about seeing the state of her soul. I think it's number 36 in her diary. And so uh, what happened is Weber's book got traction all of the way for some reason, very, very late. Maybe he published a book later, I don't know. 
but I found it fascinating with all of the people, including even people like Joey Lomangino and others in Barry Hanratty, where everybody thought these things would happen earlier as we all did. Uh, but here we are in the year 2023, still nothing. But Aldrich, Albrecht Weber, who is a friend of Garabandal in no way would ever want to hurt it. My question is why it took so long for that to come out. Now, as far as the Pope going to Moscow, mm. there's, there's several iterations of this now. The Pope, for this, this Pope has always wanted to visit Moscow. And there, if you go back, his first request to do this was in 2018, where he said he wanted to be invited. But a Pope by and large has to be invited from the president of a country. Patriarch Kirill could invite him, but a Pope wants to be invited by the president of a country to make sure he's welcome there by the, the governmental establishment. It can't be just from Kirill alone where, where the Vatican will decide to say yes. So Francis has wanted to go for a long time. And then I uh, guess what? Uh, the war began uh, one year ago in two days, right? February 25th. Today's the 23rd. Say the 23rd. Mm, yeah. Almost one year now. Yeah. It, it's one year, I think, in two days, the 25th, I think, where it, it was well known where the Pope actually walked over to the Russian embassy and wanted to meet so he could be invited to Moscow. And at that point, um, you know, he didn't go. And there's been other instances where, and he had even said coming back from the December, what, 2021 trip coming home from Cyprus, where he flew out of, when he did his Cyprus in Greece, just mm. before Christmas, when he came home, he said he wanted to go to Moscow and Russia, I think he said there. But the, the fact is this Pope does want to go and um, but there, a patriarch Kirill of the Russian Orthodox, where they were kind of bosom buddies and talking and Kirill and um, Francis had actually met in Havana many years before that. I think something like 2016 or 15, they had actually met in, in Havana. So they know each other. They've spoken on the phone and they considered themselves brothers in the faith. But what happened is Kirill, within the last six or eight months, as a patriarch underneath the Russian church, where you just can't step too far out of bounds, um, uh, Kirill supported Putin in the Russian war, which has very much alienated mm -hmm. a, a lot of the West. And, um, and even Francis himself felt that NATO provoked the war. Mm. But so a yeah, lot he did mention something like that in one of his discourses. Right. But, six, but I was just what I was trying to get to was that uh, you were saying that only it's only been mentioned by one particular person that um, the Pope will visit Fran um, Moscow before the warning. Uh, uh, is that right? <laughs> Tell you, I can tell you from an, a, a bit of, of a few more years whether or not you've got a more vo modern visionary or something like that. So that's an entirely different matter. But the people who have been who have written about it, the only source that I've ever seen now, literally since I've been reading on this since 1984. And, you know, it's not like I sit up every night with a, with, a, with, a, with a lamp looking at this stuff every night. <laughs> Nobody can ever find a source, you know, that's dated more to the Garabandal era coming directly from the Garabandal visionaries other than Albrecht Weber. So that, someone wrote in the comments of our in the live chat that Conchita mentioned the Pope visiting Moscow, Russia in one of her interviews when she was older. Possible. Okay. But yeah, my, my concern is that people are putting too much hope on, onto that one little single event. And um, it's not, it can easily backfire on people and cause people to lose faith or hope in the prophecies. 
Well, there's always there's always the concern, you know, is, is I've been around this stuff now for a long time. And I can tell you as soon as I, you know, Garabandal and Medjugorje, these things with eight days before, nine days before. These are a little bit different with the prophetic because they're coming from the Blessed Mother and, and, and they're more established and they're more tried and true. But when I see people predicting dates, I've been doing this stuff for a long time. And if I've learned one thing, nobody's really an expert on everything. But I can tell you, when I see people predicting dates specifically on events, I can't run fast enough. Mm-hmm. There's there's different reasons for that. I think there's an element of pride with people always trying to predict things specifically and be, quote, the prophet where I said this. I've seen an element of that. There's some very, very, very good people piecing things together very logically, cogently, scholarly, philosophically, theologically. And there's some and there's an element where Jesus says no one will know the hour of the day, but we can know the season. But anybody mm. paying any attention right now to what's happening in the world would have to say we're inching closer to Garabandal and the, and the prophecies coming true. It, it, all you've and, got to do is take a look at the world, the world with this, with the nuclear capability, I could, it, it, anything could happen immediately and the world could go into a great state of chaos, whether it's going to be Taiwan, China, whether it's going to be Russia, Ukraine, whether with, there's prophecies with literally Russia rolling their tanks all over Eastern Europe. And literally a general said just the other day, it would take us six minutes to get our tanks into Poland, literally just last week. Russia? Russia's tanks? Yeah, literally a Russian general. In other words, uh, even I saw something today. Serbia is prepping for war. It was on. I just saw an article today. Everybody's uneasy. So is anything possible? Yes. And any, I think a person would be a fool to say that, that these things are not possible. But I think there has to be a, a judicious sense of restraint on always predicting exactly when. And, you know, so, and if the Pope does go to Moscow, which I hope he goes and gives this prophecy a chance to happen, would I expect something to happen? Yes. Right. Well, that's interesting to hear. Um, Stephen, would you like to ask any of the questions that you've prepared? Yeah, um, I apologize earlier. It was my turn to have technical problems. So <laughs> <clears throat> so I apologize. Um, in Madison, we're having some uh, a pretty good snowstorm and a pretty good ice storm right now. So uh, it doesn't surprise me. I'm actually kind of surprised it hasn't uh, kind of conked out earlier. So um, yeah, one of the questions, uh, not to not to divert, but one of the questions I had for you, Ted, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the Bayside prophecies in Bayside, New York. I know that those are not officially approved by the church, uh, but I'd just like to hear your perspectives on them and just, you know, how much credence you think they have and all of that stuff. Bayside's interesting, you know, first of all, to say that they're not approved is an understatement. They've actually been officially condemned. Okay, I did not know that. Okay. The best of, yeah. By knowledge, that's like in the in the world of apparitions, when a bishop, a fish, there's, there's different levels of, of flat out approval, a bishop leaving it alone, or the Vatican li- literally leaving it alone, like they did with Gory and Garabandal. It's never been condemned. And so they just leave it alone. So then there is condemnation, which you've seen in several places. Bayside, uh, I, I don't, I don't, you know, God, I don't think I've even heard the name Bayside now in 15 years. But um, I remember reading this Bayside, Veronica Lucan. Um, w- w- when did they end? Since you brought it up, do you remember the last year? Um, to my understanding, because that's one of the prophecies I have followed, to my understanding, it is still going on interspersed. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not um, they're not as common as they used to be, but to my understanding, the uh, 
the revelations are still happening in Bayside. Uh, but I could be I could be incorrect. You know, I could well, be absolutely wrong. I wouldn't pay attention to anything I said either, because, as I said, it isn't anything that I've ever followed. But I do remember this and I found Bayside fascinating in this respect. <clears throat> Any apparition that does one of two things will usually, the church will come down on it very, very hard. Any, any apparition that criticizes the clergy, number one, in any way whatsoever is critical of the clergy, which as we know that Garabandal literally spoke about that there are bishops and cardinals bringing the people to perdition, which the clergy don't like that. So that's number one. La Salette literally spoke about where uh, the Blessed Mother said to Melanie and Maximum that the, 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 ch the church was a cesspool or the clergy was a cesspool of impurity. Mm. How about them apples? A cesspool of impurity. That's mm. pretty emotive. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty understanding what that means. And sure. so the, the church in France to this day has never approved La Salette. I remember when I went there around 1999 and asked to get the message of La Salette. And at La Salette, they didn't even sell the message that was given. It was a bishop of Lee, Italy who actually um, uh, 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 approved La Salette. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a French bishop because the Blessed Mother, according to the messages, was very, very critical of that. And the number, the number two one is if they're critical of Freemasonry. And Bayside, since that's your question, was critical of uh, Freemasonry and the clergy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talking about the corruption. And, and okay, so look how far back Bayside was. And we know what happened with the corruption and the clergy and everything to do with the with the lawsuits that really started very, very heavily with, with opening up under cardinal law. All of the uh, lawsuits starting with pedophilia. And they even made a movie out of that, uh, you know, what happened in Boston. The movie was... Okay. Yeah. That is in it. And it's, it's literally on the Boston Diocese of what happened under cardinal law where they were uncovering corruption in the sexual improprieties there. So Bayside, I found it fascinating, although I've never really studied it, but I do know that it spoke about those two things, which will basically be almost like a death knell. When the church comes against you and condemns you, it's pretty much like taking a, a six shooter right to your heart and unloading it. No, no chamber, no chambers left with a bullet. They just unload them right into your heart because once you're condemned, you're pretty much finished. Well, that's interesting. That that is really an interesting take on it. Yeah, and I think um, I think one one more question I had, if we've got time, um, is with all of the talking voices. You know, we have uh, Champion Wisconsin. You know, we've, you and I talked about that a little. That uh, the other day, you know, Lords and Fatima and La Salette and Garibandal. Um, to those of you, to those people who are listening to this interview and this um, conversation, uh, what advice do you recommend if a person is starting to look at these apparitions and study them and really want to get something from them? How would you suggest uh, starting to study these things and, and making sure that that the studier is not led astray? I, I think, you know, it's a good question for a person who uh, I would stay it, which was always, I stayed, even with the Thunder Justice, I stayed in the major leagues. I didn't really need to go down to high school uh, baseball, single A, double A, triple A. I mean, I stayed, I stayed with the Yankees and the Red Sox, which, you know, I stayed, uh, Fatima, Akita, La Salette, Guadalupe, Rue de Bac, which kind of opened up the Marian age. Mm -hmm. uh, I, Pont Maine, I would stay with what's been approved in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there aren't that many approved at the Vatican level in the church. 
Akita message is very close to, which is in a very, very apocalyptic message. The single most apocalyptic message that I can ever think of in any Marian apparition is Akita Japan in 1973, where the Blessed Mother said, the living will envy the dead. Mm -hmm. and, and literally, we're living Akita right now, where it talks about one of the messages uh, it, we would see it. Now, think back in 1973, with, which it was very, very hard to understand how this was possible. We would see cardinal opposing cardinal, bishop opposing bishop, priest opposing a priest, confrere against confrere. We have never had in the Catholic Church such open dissension among ranking clergy, ranking cardinals like we see today. It's a brand new phenomenon. You may have seen a lot of things whispered. There are a lot of liberal people that didn't like John Paul II, but there was never this open dissension. You had a cardinal um, literally uh, called Pope Francis a Machiavellian liar. I mean, that isn't the sort of thing that you saw from the College of Cardinals. So that is Akita, cardinal opposing cardinal. We have right now a tremendous division uh, among uh, you, you, you uh, among people. Any, any of right now the people listening to the to this thing, if if you only need to be in a conversation with a person many times for just several minutes. And you'll know just where they stand by their politics, uh, their religion, or whatever it is, uh, their view on abortion, their view on migration, immigration. Do they like Biden? Do they hate Trump? Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. People uh, very, very quickly are now making decisions on what they're going to, who they're going to be friends with based upon what's being said uh, in just a very brief amount of minutes today. That never used to be like that. And people are more vocal. So I would say in answer to your question, stick with the major leagues, stick with Akita, Fatima, <clears throat> you know, um, the first seven apparitions at Medjugorje have been approved by the church, which is in essence, it, it's an approval to go forward and people and priests and bishops can even bring pilgrimages there now. And so I've never had any problem with Medjugorje. I've always known it was true, but the church just took a while to get there. And, and that's not all that bad because when the church rules on one, they will be right. And, 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 and that's what we've seen that. It's been great having you on, uh, Ted. Your knowledge is really amazing, and I um, <laughs> will definitely love to have you on again because we, can't, yeah, I agree. we probably can't cover everything at the moment because, you know, you've got so much uh, in-depth knowledge, but we'll love to have you on again to, to discover and discuss some, some more topics in, in detail, if you like. Um, but just wrapping up, there's been a lot of discussion in our live chat. I've been following our live chat as we've been going. <laughs> People talking about um, Malachi Martin, the third secret of Fatima, um, the Wormwood prophecy. Um, if possible, would you be able to give us, you know, just a little bit of a summary on, on what you know about, you know, I know that you've met Malachi Martin. Have you discussed, uh, of, he probably didn't <laughs> tell you what the third secret was, but, you know, what will be good to hear your point of view on, on some of those things. Well, Again, that's pretty broad. Yes, Malachi Martin actually did introduce for us to the Thunder of Justice. And um, I actually, he came down and visited us for a day. We spent a day together in our office once. And I put him in a film. Um, he had our whole staff mesmerized by the way he was talking. But um, yeah, I, I know the Malachi Martin. I've, I've, I've been in his apartment several times in New York where... We spent the entire afternoon talking, and I took a late train home. Um, his book, Windswept House, is, is a book for somebody to read because we're living it now. And another book of his is, is called The Cat of This Blood. Um, 
windswept house. If since you asked, there's just one very quick story I'll tell about um, windswept house. It's his book about the fight for the new world order, and and the the protagonist is a priest by the name of Father Gladstone from Galveston, Texas. He's a man's man. He you know he's the type of man he knows. Sports. He he's a scholar. He's a theologian. He's holy. He's he's got the savoir faire of a very very brilliant man, and he's the type of man where two people are playing chess and he can just walk by and say you need to move your queen thing. And so, but there's one. It's the hermeneutical key for anybody looking to read Windswept House, and and the Pope actually commissions Gladstone from Rome to go find out. Uh, more about this new world order. And if a person misses this law, it's a very, very critical one. The Pope says to Gladstone, find out if it's organized. That's the key phrase almost in the entire book where the Pope commissions Gladstone about this new world order and quote, find out if it's organized. And the fact that it is organized because there's a cabal of evil people that have an agenda that is satanic to subject <laughs> mankind for their own evil purposes. What's happening now is satanic by an evil group of people that are anti-God. They don't want God in the picture. Now that's the age old part of this. They don't want God in any affairs of mankind. And, and does that um, summarize the, the third secret of Fatima? No, the third epic, epic battle. We've been told what the third secret of Fatima is. You know, uh, I, I, I'll never forget this. In 1992, I've never forgotten it for a second. Malik, and I even wrote this on an article that I wrote just recently and posted called The Prophecies of Ukraine. And I did it before the war. And I mentioned Malachi Martin. And Pedro Regis has quite a bit on this too, where he, Pedro Regis literally even mentioned Donetsk, D O N E T Z K, depending on your spelling, Ukraine or Russian. He said it would begin in Donetsk. That's exactly where, that's the Russian part of the Ukraine. But we know the third secret where it's been told to us very, very clearly through the Marian movement of priests that it's the apostasy in the church and that um, uh, Satan would penetrate the hierarchy to the summit, the summit of the church, that Satan would virtually go right to the summit of the church. The third secret of Fatima is the extreme apostasy in the church. It's not a secret any longer. It's been told by many, many people now exactly what it is. And there isn't anybody with more clarity on what the third secret of Fatima is than Father Stefano Gobi of the Marian Movement of Priests, that Satan would reach the summit of the church. And my by question, summit, do you mean like the Pope? My question would be to anybody, what's the summit? Yeah, when, that's that's the question I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, when you climb Mount Everest, every picture you see with somebody up there, they always take a picture with at the exact same place with that cone sharp rock. That's the summit of Everest. So what is the summit of the church? Good question. What is it? Well, to, to me, the summit's the Pope all the way to the papacy. Yeah. That's what, to me, the summit is. But the summit could also be interpreted also as the hierarchy, and they're all, they are called yeah. the princes of the church. And we've got a lot of bad actors right now. I mean, take a look at some of the, these cardinals, the, the, the stuff that they're promoting, which is also nobody's ever touched doctrine in the clergy like this. They could have social agendas that are different. There has always been in the church different views on capital punishment. It's allowed in the catechism. It's allowed scripturally. Uh, capital punishment is permissible. Many popes don't approve of it. John Paul I didn't approve of it. Out of mercy, they don't approve of it, but, but it's permissible to have it. So there's different opinions of what could happen socially, but nobody in, 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 at, the, at the level of the papacy has tampered with what's going on right now.
with with the material. And you have people like Cardinal Mueller, Archbishop Vagano, and others that are are very very vocal on on the direction of the church right now. And I think they're very very bright lights. Right. Um, we've got probably another ten minutes if you can stay with us, uh, Ted. I know we promised you only one hour, but there's just so much to cover, and you, the information you're giving us is really amazing. Well, We've I don't got, think uh, I stay with you. I don't think anybody else could take me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're well, pretty you, cool. <laughs> we've got 220 people watching live, so that's sweet. That they're enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just great, and I mean, all of this. Um, I think you're doing just such a great job in, in explaining where all of this stuff is and where it's coming from and why it's important. And, I, you know, we are in some very, very scary times right now. And it's, it's just, you know, and it doesn't take, you know, Ron and I have spoken about this. And, you know, two plus two stopped equaling four many years ago. And I don't think it takes a genius to see that this stuff is happening and it's serious and it really needs to be uh, paid attention to and, and really explored. So yeah, I'm just, I'm enjoying it. So I, I really thank you for joining us. Well, I say never say never and never <clears throat> always, you know, I mean, That's I, a good one. I, I've been around so much of this right now that I'm just very, very cautious when I hear things. I mean, uh, you know, I talked to you the other day, Ron, in, in 1994, I was on a speaking tour of New Zealand and Australia. Uh, you know, I was in your city of Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, Perth, Adelaide, Christchurch, and, you know, New Zealand and some of the cities. And, you know, and uh, with every signal signature, I was, it was a three week trip. It was the best trip of my life, actually. I had never been to Australia. And with every single book signature, somebody's whispering something in here. And I can't tell you how many times w traveling and whether it's, you know, dinners after with people saying, God told me. And a person's got to be very, very, very cautious when it comes to that kind of thing mm -hmm. of, of what is a subliminal suggestion versus a true locution, an apparition. Or, or just their own thought. And so due to the internet, I remember, I remember hearing once from Father Gobi when I was going to Maryland, and, Father, and, and this would have been, uh, what about 1994 or five or something, where Father Gobi literally said 80% of the visionaries in the world that were false, he said, were from the United States. Mm. Oh, wow, that's so interesting. amazing. That's him telling me that. And, you know, it's not you can get jaundiced and prejudiced pretty quick, but, you know, you have to still maintain an openness in, in what the Holy Spirit's doing. So I say, you know, when you wake up tomorrow morning, be absolutely surprised at nothing. Mm. You know, we Good point. should be surprised at anything that can happen. I'm interested to hear that um, you, you also follow Pedro Regis. On our channel, we try to um, share some of his messages as well. Do you have any? Would you be able to go in, maybe as a last, <laughs> in the last five minutes, go into some of his, um, you were talking about one of his messages on Donetsky or on the war in Russia and Ukraine? Yeah, I, I, th I don't think I finished the thought. Malachi Martin told me to, in 1992, which allegedly he had seen the third secret, and he said, never take your eyes off the Ukraine. And I found that fascinating. Now, I had been to the Ukraine in, in 91 and 92 several times. I had an office and an apartment in Poland in Warsaw. My project was in Krakow for two years. Then I was in Belarus for two years. I was in a, an oblast north of Chernobyl for two years called Gomel. Uh, I was going in and out of there on a big project. I was actually working on a World Bank contract, retrofitting power plants in Eastern Europe. And the country that I chose to go into first was Poland. So my project was the big um, pollution belching power plant in Krakow called Novos 
Nova Huta. It's the Scavina power plant down there. And so you know, there, there, was an, there was an apparition in the Ukraine called Hirushu, where ju just 500,000 people saw the Blessed Mother above the church. So these wow. global, it, 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 it's, it's the way they say it, Hirushu, but it doesn't look like anything like that phonetically in, in even English, never mind Cyrillic. But um, uh, Pedro Regis, we, we've probably done in our magazine 10 articles on Pedro Regis. And um, we, were the, we were actually the first ones to ever write him up way, way back. Um, and we spent hours and hours with him and his translator on the phone to make sure it was exactly the way it was supposed to be. We didn't use Google translation or anything like that because these, these religious words, a lot of them have nuances that other, other, uh, letter, uh, other words in the alphabet are not nuanced as much like, uh, like religious and spiritual language can be. But I haven't seen anybody in the modern era, um, you know, I'm talking maybe since the 90s or something, as accurate in their prophecies as Pedro Regis. And, and if he names your city, the city's going to be in trouble. You know, I live, I live 22 miles right now from the, from the White House gate. And he, you know, he talked about Donetsk. You called it Donetsky. It's Donetsk. And um, he talked about the city on the Potomac. Well, the city on the Potomac is actually Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> when Pedro Regis mentions your city, basically timed, you know, to start praying more. Yeah. Praying more. <laughs> Fervently. Yeah, yeah, I, that, that, and that's really interesting, and that, um, uh, and I, I think that that's your spot on with that. Um, one, and I, and I think I'm guessing since uh, uh, Ron has disappeared, I'm, oh, he's coming back, there he is. Yeah, it's been a very bad day for <laughs> <laughs> technical problems, <laughs> apologize for that. I wasn't able to catch what you said at the end about well, Pedro the, Regis. Course, that's, that's okay. Since you asked about Pedro Regis, he mentioned yes. way back before the election of Pope Francis, he said there would be two, there would be two popes, but only one Peter, and one would go with science. Mm, one that's would go. He said, so here, before we had uh, Pope Benedict resign, um, there would be, you know, he resigned February 11th, and I think it was like two weeks later or something that Francis was elected in conclave. And so he um, said there would be two, two popes and one Peter, and one would go with wow. sign. We found that absolutely fascinating. And the fact mm. of the matter um, Francis has gone with uh, with global warming and climate change, which, which is him going with science. We have a question here. Um, what does that mean, every every city? Well, he when he mentions a city, it, like he mentioned Donetsk, it basically means that it's it's going to experience some sort of hardship if you go back and look. I mean, the the inference on the city on a Potomac, I I, I forget now. Here I even live here, um, that it would be, um, that it would have some sort of destruction. I'd need to go back and look mm. at it exactly now rather than try to interpret, yeah, to interpret something wrong. Well, maybe we can hopefully um, have you on again to discuss some of these questions in more detail. It's yeah, been an be hour brilliant. and 30 minutes now. We just thank you so much for coming on. And you've shared a lot of really fascinating information and knowledge with us. So thank you again, Ted. Um, 
just to wrap up, can you just tell us how people can find you on the internet? Um, tell us about your website, about how they can buy your book. Yeah, all of my books are on Amazon and Ingram. Um, they're an ebook as well as hard copy. And uh, our website that we've had, uh, we've had our apostolate now, uh, I guess, since what, 19... 87 or 88 i forget now it's 35 years but um the, the website address is sign.org s-i-g-n.org and they can see we post stuff i post articles there quite a bit um there's uh, we have a magazine we still go hard copy magazine there's still a lot of people like it uh, you know every magazine probably seen by seven or eight more people, prayer group share them. And we've been writing on the, the issues that we've been speaking about now for 35 years. We've done probably 10 installments of Pedro. We know Christina Gallagher. We post a lot of her stuff over the years of, of, of Ackle Sound Island. Christine is a friend. We talk to her just to stay in touch with her probably once or twice a year. And so we're just doing the same things every day, trying to promote the Blessed Mother's messages. Too. God bless you. That sounds amazing. Yeah. And um, like I said, we'll hopefully have you on again if you accept. Uh, would you be able to finish or wrap up with a prayer, if possible? Um, just a prayer of your sure. choice. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to come on anytime because there's not a shortage of material. Father in heaven, we ask you to be with all of us, our families, all of our concerns, our endeavors. Give us the light we need to make good decisions. Have us maintain an openness to what the Holy Spirit's doing. And we ask for all of your protection around all of us to put your protective hedge in this evil day. Be with all of us and all of our families. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Thank you. Till next time, everyone. Thank you and goodbye.